more than 150 years, Mammut stands for quality and innovations. Deeply rooted in the Swiss mountains, beautiful nature, full of experiences and magic moments. We want to welcome you to Mammut Swiss 1862, here from Zeon, our headquarter in the heart of Switzerland. I'm Oliver, I'm the CEO of Mammut, and I'm happy and honored to kick off our first digital brand conference, convention actually. For all of us, on behalf of the whole Mammut family, more than 800 people around the world. What we would like to share with you is what moves us, what's at our core, and what our heart beats for in the future. It's a pretty packed week, the digital brand conventions, and we have some support from a professional anchor woman from the Swiss TV, a professional, let's say, a passionate skier from the Engadin, Anina. Welcome, Anina. Hello. Hi, folks at home, and thank you so much, Oliver. I'm so pleased to be here and that we open these doors to the wonderful world of Mammut. But it is a quite unique situation, as you pointed it out yourself already, because usually at this time of the year, we had the, or you guys had the sales convention, which obviously can't happen because of the COVID situation. And how do you, Mammut, deal with this whole past seven months, which were outstanding in a weird way? In a, in a way weird, but I think as we didn't call it crisis, we called it momentum. A lot of things happening or happened. And I think we took it uh, uh, pretty positive. As I shared with you already, me personally, I even enjoyed it because, you know, it's, it was very demanding. Partly it was as well stressful for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think it was as well a moment where we grew together as a team, even stronger than before and we use the time to adapt to the so-called new normal. And in a way, what we do here is to invite all of you to the brand convention is very different to what we have been done before. Usually, from all over the world, we would Thinking come together, yeah, to we more than 200 people, people yeah, to show the new collections, uh, concepts, innovations, and now we share it with you guys out there. And still you have a whole week ahead, right? There's yeah, I mean, it's a kickoff. Uh, so you guys are with us of the entire uh, week of the actually we, we use the entire week partly now today It's it's public. Yeah, then we use a couple of days uh, Internally mm -hmm. to work still with a global team and on Thursday uh, around uh, 6 p.m. CET we come back together and share with you another stories around Mammut. Okay, so you said you take the positive out of this kind of what Eric used to call crisis. So what's the observation you do? Maybe let's point it out for the retail section. What does it mean for a brand like Mammut? Yeah, I mean, all of us in that industry, and as well personally, what, what we learned during the lockdown, mm -hmm. and even after the lockup, how much important nature is for us. I mean- People uh, wanted to go out, back to basics. We wanted to go out, back yeah. to, to enjoy even the micro adventure around our place. And that's a pretty strong uh, feeling. We, we, mm -hmm. we, we, I think it was important that people felt again how to attach to nature. You know, it, it enriches us, not only physically as well mentally. I think, yeah, nature is beautiful and we are in that. You know, it's, it's our, so to say, industry. And you have a great outcome when it comes down to the preparation you did for this entire week and especially also for today. I would say we have like three topics which we focus on today, which is safety. You help me out here. Corporate Safety. responsibility, which we will be discussing in a while, very yeah. deep down again, in a very interesting um, panel. Uh, panel discussion. Yeah, have a and panel of discussion. course, we have innovation. Yeah, cool. Anina, you got the uh, uh, agenda. It was so impressive to see that these changes had accelerated so rapidly in the last two to three years. I think the, the special things for the Mammoth Alpha School is really the safety. They are so on a, on a high point on the safety, that's a really good thing. The innovative part of the welding, if you think about environmental impact, is that we don't have stitches and we don't need glue. There are so many more products you can create with this technology. Ooh, 
I've seen a lot already. I can't wait to see all what's new on the market for autumn, winter 21, 22. What is it? Actually, you have to ask Max. He is our chief product officer and he is in charge for all our products. So the whole entire product uh -huh. come from him. So talk to him. All right. Ah, there he is, Max. Hi, Anina. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yes, same here. Oh my God, that sounds like a serious job you've got there. What is it exactly you do? Yeah, first of all, I'm very much a hiker, mountaineer, climber myself, so I love to go to the mountains. Oh, and but I mean as a nature. work, as a job. Yeah, as a work, <laughs> but that's the starting point, actually. That's the starting point. As a, a professional career uh, with my team, I'm responsible for product at Mammut, which means from design to development and then also to fulfillment of the product. Oh, so that's helpful. You're an outdoor, outdoor guy, so you love doing that and you know what all the equipment needs to have. Exactly, and that's that super sense. important for us, for the entire team, because we really need to understand uh, what are the problems in the use cases when yeah. we are out in the activities. And then, based on those understandings, we can really cater for, for the needs of our consumers yeah. and really can try to improve yeah. our products all the time. And do you do that for all, for all products or just the hardware or just the outdoor gear? or all No, exactly, ropes? for, all for, for the entire product groups. Offer. Yeah, exactly. Also, for example, these Barry Fox, I have one of those. Is there a new one? You have our Barry Rocks? Yeah. I have one with exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah, but that's the one I have. That's not new, is it? Uh, it's uh, not new for this season, uh -huh. but uh, what we do with the Barry Rocks, it's an electronical uh, device. So every season we keep it up to date with, with uh, performance updates of the firmware. So that we have ah. always the latest technology and the highest so uh, the software. possible performance. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I can get an, a software update. Can I do that at home? No, you cannot do it at home. You you need to see a local dealer, and then ah, he can he can uh, upload the update for you. And then by going in the store, I can also check out the very new collection. Exactly, you can perfectly prepare for the entire season uh -huh. because I think um, as uh, most of you of, of us, we are looking forward to the snow which is coming, right? So we want to prepare to to really go out and have fun. So yeah, that there and see. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to have a closer look to all the detailed products later on. Thank you for talking, Max. And for you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to withhold you one guy, and that is Oli. Most of you know him personally because usually of the year, as we heard already from Oliver, people came in here to see what's happening for this sales convention. And now you're standing here with me instead. I'm sorry, but how, how is that for you? Well, obviously for us, it's also kind of new dealing with that uh -huh. kind of situation. As Oliver mentioned before, it was like uh, two, three hundred people coming, attending our sales convention, like experiencing the whole excitement around the new collection. Which is and important now it's, for the CCO, right? I'm sorry? Which is important for you. Absolutely. I mean, the excitement yeah. about the product, about the collection, about the novelty in yeah. the collection is key. But still, we are, we are very excited that we have the opportunity now to do it digitally. Uh -huh. And that meaning not only like internally, but what we do is actually embracing the situation, opening it up to our retailers and opening it up to our consumers. How does the new normal look like uh, on where you stand in Mammoth for the commercial side? I mean, because new normal for us commercially changes, right? means, means pretty much working in this very moment each and every day. Obviously, you're challenged by a new situation, but it's always about finding solutions together with our partners, uh -huh. finding relevance also in the market, relevance for our retailers and relevance for our end consumers. So that's actually what's driving us on a daily basis. All right. Just Let's, like today. Actually. Just like today. Let's get together all this core management, maybe not too close. Of course, I can get close to this guy. He's not real. So here we have <laughs> the core, the mammoth core, kind of like the top management, right? I mean, it's the three of us at least in charge of products, sales, uh -huh. and let's say guiding those guys a bit. But we have a full team, as I shared with you before, 800 people around the globe or more than 800 people around the globe. So we are only, let's say, representing uh, our team here. And we will get to know some of the rest, a lot of the rest, right soon in a bit. But first, we want to address something. We had discussed the panel discussion that's coming up later on with top class guests, where we're going to talk about corporate responsibility. And also after that today at 6 p.m., oh no, this upcoming Thursday, Thursday at 6 p.m., yeah. we have all about glaciers coming up, where we see you again in a panel discussion, right? Yeah, yeah. I have the, the pleasure actually to, to, let's say, finalize the week uh, on Thursday with uh, as well you guys out there. 
we will have, I think, a very good presentation around what, what we do, how we address uh, the climate change. And we would like to share with you as well that we are kicking off a kind of movement together for glaciers because we truly believe that glaciers, I mean, it's the heart of our, yeah, of our, of our sport, of, of, of nature, that we need to take care of it by reducing our own CO2 footprint. And more will come uh, latest on Thursday, 6 p.m. CET. All right, and right now, everybody, I hope wherever you are right now, you have the time to lean back and dive into this world of mammoth. Enjoy. Mammut started its journey in Switzerland almost 160 years ago. A proud manufacturer of outdoor products that live up to the highest industry standards. Mammut seeks to preserve what is worth preserving, the beauty of mountain landscapes. For this reason, more than 800 passionate people started an initiative to strengthen the fight against glacier melt. If we act now, if we contribute on a global level, each and every one, to that topic. We are still able to slow the process down to an extent that we save lost ice shields. But good intentions alone are not enough. The industry doesn't have all the answers yet. That's why Mammut is devoted to creating a lasting contribution via ongoing innovation in fabrics and technologies. In innovation, it's always important to stay ahead of the game, keep moving continuously, evolve, and further develop the materials and the products we're working on. In the alpine environment, the highest quality is an absolute necessity to survive. Making the mountains safer has been Mammut's core since the very early days as a rope manufacturer. We at Mammut working every day to keep people safe and secure in the mountains. The best combination is the balance between motivation and safety. All of this combined is simply Mammut. My name is Alice. I work at Mammut since pretty much one year now. I am a corporate responsibility manager at Mammut both on ecological but also social aspects of sustainability. One of Mammut's aims is to become a climate neutral company. Carbon emissions are the primary cause of melting glaciers worldwide. Raising the awareness of what every single person can do in achieving this goal is what Alice and her team are working on. Adrian Huber has been leading the team since 2008. The corporate responsibility department is located at Mammut's headquarters in Switzerland. What I experienced at Mammut during the last 12 months, I really felt I, I found a bit my place in a way, especially with the people, because Mammut to me means that we have a great team. We have a lot of people that uh, love mountains, that are passionate about what they're doing. And for me, that's maybe the most important thing. Adrian is actually my boss, and I don't know any person who is that positive. I think he's really an extreme optimist. To work with an extreme optimist in the topic of sustainability is just the best thing that can happen to you. You see here, it's uh, Pitz Palus, it's oh, yeah. the Benina yes, yeah. Massif. Do you remember I told you about the, the ski tour I did with my father? We, we went up to Pitz Palus and then we drove all the way down with the skis. And I remember that here the ice ended, somewhere here. So I look at this map, this dates until 1878, and it was still the whole glacier going down. Yeah. That was a kind of my glacier moment. I mean, I know about <laughs> glacier melting, but, but it made it really tangible to me, yeah. very emotional. Yeah. This is really, yeah, this is very fascinating mm. to see how it used to be and how it most probably will be mm. in, uh, in 100 years from now. 
I just ask myself, like, how can we really move people by by bringing this fascinating landscape, by bringing the, the consequences, the story to even people that live in cities. The conclusion of this meeting for me was that, first of all, we need to do something. We want to start a movement. We need to include people. We want to understand that better by also contacting and being in contact with specialists to really deepen into the topic and make it more relevant. My name is Seppi Strohmeyer. I've been with Mammut since six years. My role is Innovation Manager. I'm responsible for all the projects that deal with new developments of materials, technologies and products. The whole project around Fotex is about a new way of bonding textiles, which allows us to completely change the way how we create down chambers. What's so special about it is that we don't stitch the down chambers. We actually use laser energy to bond two fabrics together and we can control the energy of the laser in such a precise way that we can bond fabrics to a waterproof breathable membrane that's just a few micrometers thick without affecting its properties. This technology is so new that we actually had to develop our own machine. So Mammut is the only company in the market to have this technology at hand. It has been a long way. It took almost two years to launch first product as a limited edition style of 500 jackets. It was an immediate success. Meanwhile, a complete collection for both men and women is now available. Research and development in exploring new materials continues. So quality is one of the big pillars in product development for Mammut. So whenever we come up with a new product, we have to make sure that it's fit for the end use, and it just doesn't fall apart. We want to find out how strong is the connection between the materials we're welding together. So we are using samples of um, five centimeter wide pieces of material with a, with a welding seam in the center and we attach them to the machine where the top material and the bottom material are then pulled apart from each other. What we can see now is that the tensile strength is going up and up and up and we're, we reach a level here now of something like 80 to 90 Newton. This is a really strong seam, so very happy with the result and this looks like a promising material we can use for a future season in Fotix. Having done those tests here at Mammut, we now go and see our machine partner where we uh, further develop the technology on the machine side and see, and see what the status is there. Today we are meeting Christine Conkert at Leicester. She not only works on the development of the machines with us, but she also supports us in bringing the fabrics to the next level. Hello, Seppi. Hey, Christine. How are you doing? Excellent, how are you? So let's get inside and we can start project to bring this technology to the market together with Leicester to develop a machine to test those materials started probably around three years ago. So Christine, the reason why I'm here today is that we found this new material that looks quite promising for laser fuse technology. Okay, let's have a look. So you have a layer of laser transparent material. Yes, you have the laser absorbing component. Okay, yeah. It's a polyester material. We might have to tweak, to, tweak yeah. the parameters a little bit. And test it, yeah. The whole idea is to create a waterproof down jacket. Okay. Where the down chambers are fully waterproof. There is no way down is leaking outside of the garment and there is no way for water to enter into the garment. Okay. Sounds pretty interesting to me. So let's try that. Leicester produce welding machines for plastic since around about 20 years. And now we are actually getting a little bit further and we're trying to weld textiles. This is also what Memo did in a cooperation with us. We developed one machine together and this is the first one. And now we have to see how far we can get with this technology. So that's what we are doing today. We're coming with a completely new material. No one knows how it's going to turn out and I'm quite excited to see if that's going to work or not. But before we can get started, we have to wear these laser safety glasses. All right. Because actually this is dangerous, the laser could damage our eyes. Oh, the world turns green. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> all in green. So yeah, let's get started. Cool, I'm excited. Okay.
My name is Elroy Damart. I'm the product manager for Avalanche Safety at Mammut. I'm working here for 10 years now and I'm responsible for all our Avalanche Safety products. And that's why I'm today here and I'm traveled to Andermatt because we got really, really early snow this, this season. So I will meet there Andrea from the Mountain Alpine School. And then later on, Nadine will join us, one of our pro athletes. The necessary or the essential is to do your risk management, to be really well prepared. And for me, the risk management starts at home. If you're young and it's your first time, you see only this big picture, this guy's going big and huge, yeah? You don't see they were trapped in an avalanche or the close calls. You only see this really inspiring pictures, a big high five, and everybody is going with laugh from the mountain. I prepared an avalanche field for the training with the beacon. I think the, the special things for the Mammoth Alpes because it's really the safety. They are so on a high point on the safety. That's a really good thing here. Yeah. 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And here it is. That's it. Well done. Perfect. The snowpack has a lot of interesting information for us. It gives us an idea how is the snowpack settled. That's like a book. It's like oh, it's on a tree, those um, rings, they, they're growing with the tree over the years. So we can really look into the past and the season and look which snow has fallen at which point and how it has those created the snowpack. Normally snow in the early autumn, it's not so good because if it stays and uh, you have a lot of cold days, yeah. then it grows up and then that's, that's becoming a, a weak layer for the, for the rest of the season. The probability to trigger the avalanche rises if you come to an area where you have a smaller snowpack in relation to an area where you have a big snowpack. Yeah, with an old snow problem. Yeah, yeah. With an old snow problem, yes. Meanwhile, Alice is on her way to a renowned glaciologist in Zurich. I want to visit Matthias Hus today because I really want to better understand how fast glaciers are melting, what we can do to prevent them from melting, what can we do as Mammut, as brand with our community, so we can really spread that message and make it relevant for our global community as well. Thank you very much for having time for me today. I just come to learn more about your work, about our glaciers. I think what fascinates me when I meet Matthias Hus, I see the same passion in his eyes, in his voice. He has seen glaciers since he was a child. He has an emotional relation to them and I'm happy that he's around. Well, I've always loved to go into the mountains. So I really like glaciers and I, I'm so curious to see every time how they change, although it's a, it's a sad story, basically. This is a picture of Alex Glacier in 2019, and this is how it looked in 2005. This is a simulation of the future of a uh, great Alex Glacier, and we see this beautiful glacier tongue that is more than 20 kilometers long, and we have simulated this with no climate mitigation, so business as usual, and with strong efforts to protect climate. But it's not only the melting of the Alich Glacier that concerns Matthias Hus. He's even more emotional about the Pizol Glacier, which he began surveying 15 years ago. It's steep and slippery and it's just dying. I've been there maybe 50 times over the last decades. It was so impressive to see that these changes had accelerated so rapidly in the last two to three years. So today I left the ETH and Matthias Hus 
in a way sad because I I saw some pictures that um, move me. It really hurts me somehow. But I also understood that if we act now, if we contribute on a global level, each and every one to that topic, we are still able to slow the process down to an extent that we save lost uh, ice shields. Back to Leicester, Seppi and Kristen just finished the first laser test. The first test we're doing is to weld a really complicated file with small curves, tight radiuses, to see if we can use this material without creating burn marks, holes in the fabric. It's like this flush of heat going through your body. You have this file, you have a new material, you, know, you don't know what happens, and then you press the start button, the laser moves across the material, it drops down, the energy goes on, you see the red light pointing to where the laser's running across the fabric. It's like magic, you know, something that hasn't been before just appears in the material, and uh, yeah, it makes me really excited. You slightly see the lines. Mm -hmm. It's really subtle. I think it looks quite nice because it's just, it's just really thin and fine. It's always a pleasure to go up with Nadine in the field and learn from her experience which she get over the years. And it's great to hike up a boot pack because then you come in this untracked field and if you stand on top of something, you have this great view into the Swiss Alps. What is your strategy? How do you decide how to ride this cool walk? Uh, for me, it always starts at home. I check the weather, I check avalanche reports, and then I have the last check when I'm there. I want to give the youth something, how other people taught me uh, things about the mountains, about the snow and everything. And I guess it's good for, for the younger generation to get into this the earliest you can. Meanwhile, Alice is back at Mammut. I come back with just feeling strengthened in what we do here in Mammut. To realize that during my lifetime I will witness maybe a Switzerland without glaciers. This was really tough. We are on the path of really committing to reducing our carbon footprint. I think that's the first step as a brand. Really do the path and then step by step improve processes and what we do here. It is happening now. If we don't start now to act against it, it will be unstoppable somehow. Seppi is now back to test the waterproofness of the new laser welded seams. We had a really successful testing day at Leicester in the laser lab where we had the chance to test the new generations of materials we're working on. The test we're doing now is to test the waterproofness of the laser fuse seams. The way it works is we have a machine with a basin full of water. And it pumps this water with a lot of pressure against the material laying on top. And you can see now that the material is bulging up. And the, the more pressure, the more waterproofness. The result is really positive. We achieve a waterproofness that's way beyond the official standard. This means that you can actually wear the jacket under a shower or a long rain pour or a snowstorm and you're gonna stay dry for sure. We at Mahmood working every day to keep people safe and secure in the mountains. And that's why we say the best combination is the balance between motivation and safety. To move safely in the mountains and to experience them securely, you need the best equipment. But even more, you need the famous gut feeling, plus experience, and of course, common sense. Take your own safety on board. Remember first, before you drop into a culvert, make sure that you have all your safety equipment on board and that you have read your avalanche report proper to make right decisions. Stay safe. In the field of innovation, the latest developments give SEPI courage. The next step will be to use recycled fabrics alongside the laser fuse technology. 
Currently, we have a very good material on the product. The idea that I have in mind is to make the material more environment friendly. It's time for us to further develop also the technology. Alice has found an approach for a new movement, and that is climate change will only work if everyone participates. Together, with small steps, the world will take a giant leap forward. To achieve a next level and to see that we go into the right direction and, and we step further, this is really motivating. So, yeah, step by step we get there. Mamut and the power of its people. Ilari, Sepi, Alice. Three of over 800 employees worldwide who are united by one. A world moved by mountains. And now I may warmly welcome you back here in Seon, where we are still in the same studio, right in the heart, in the heart of Mammoth. But as you can clearly see, we have a total new setup. I can't wait to discuss, to go back into that door again of corporate responsibility, where we have a top class panel discussion planned with great guests, and I'm going to right introduce them right away. But first of all, I want you at home or from wherever you're watching, address that we want your inputs. We want your questions also to be joined in here. And so please share them with us in the YouTube channel at the comment section. And hopefully we can answer most of them or a lot of them at the end of our discussion. Now let me start to introduce the guests we have invited. We start with the youngest, it's Nicola Hoyak, the 20-year-old professional mammoth climber, a mammoth athlete who travels the world to climb mountains. His most notable achievement was when he broke records with Ueli Steck by being the fastest team to, to climb the Eigen North Face back in 2015. Then we have representing the Industry and trading is the ex CEO of Sportscheck, Markus Rech. He's here online since he sits in Germany. Nice to have you on board digitally. Hello, Markus. <laughs> then we have Dr. Matthias Hus, who we've already seen in the documentary, and he's working at the ETH Zurich and he is the head of the program. GLAMOS, Glacier Monitoring Switzerland, a program of several Swiss institutes and uni universities, and he will provide us with facts and results today. And of course, we also want to hear the voice of Mahmoud in this discussion, represented by Alice Martin. Or already we know you as well from the documentary. You're the Corporate Responsibility Manager of Mahmoud, and her background is a master's studies in management, organization, and culture with a strong focus on corporate responsibility. And already seen as well today, of course, we have Oliver Pabst, CEO of Mammoth since 2016. Last but not least, I'm also very pleased to welcome here in this round of discussion, Dr. Nicholas Bornstein. He has got a doctorate or a PhD in the Swiss environmental policy and is the founder and head of the Swiss climate NGO POW. POW stands for Protect Our Winters, but how? That is one of the questions we will answer within about the next 30 minutes. And maybe to, to, to see the world we're moving in now a bit again, a bit closer to go back, what we already touched a bit in the documentary. I'll start with you, Nicholas. As a professional climber, you depending on nature and on glaciers as well, which we hang it on up this discussion today a little bit. What is your personal, what do these glaciers and mountains mean to you personally? Um, the glaciers and the mountains are my life because um, our mountains wouldn't be the same without the glaciers. So if the glaciers disappear, all the mountains fell apart and we, we can't go there and climb anymore. So it would be it would destroy my profession as a professional alpinist. It's nowadays well known that we have a problem with climate warmth and also has that an impact for you in your, in your profession when you're out there in the mountains? Have you ever had stones falling almost on you or is that that's really happening rocks coming down right yeah that's true um the permafrost is melting and the mountains already started to fall apart so 
it's getting dangerous each year and yeah you can't climb um, some routes anymore so oh, really? it's really changing yeah. places you can't go anymore because of permafrost missing yeah because um, all the pillars fell apart or so the the routes aren't anymore there or the approaches um, you can't approach the wall because the, the glacier is melting down and there is a huge section you can't um, traverse so, so it's, you really see those yeah, changes it's, out it's in really nature happening. it's it's, it's really happening yeah. indeed and still you travel the world to to go on these mountains to have new challenges isn't that also a little bit of a split a challenging split for you personally that you have to do because you you kind of fly to these mountains and you know that's bad for the footprint yeah of course it's um not easy to make this uh, split because i'm also part of the problem because i'm going on expeditions and i'm also traveling but for me i decided to reduce my flights so i decided that i only fly once a year for expedition and the other time of the year i don't i try don't to travel and so in the last um, five years i could do that uh, my idea like this so um, yeah i try to to change that but to be honest if we want to change something we have mm -hmm. to to change it in our society so each person has to to play together to have an impact it's yeah. not enough if only the ones that are really seeing it clearly change something it needs us all together i think that's what we've clearly already seen also in that documentary and you are also an ambassador for power protect our winters the ngo and actually it's thanks to you also that Nicola Bornstein from Pau and Mahmoud sat together on a table. Maybe let's go back to that moment. How was that? How did you bring them together? Um, in 2018, I came to Pau as an ambassador, and at that point, uh, Nicola was a bit hating against Mahmoud because he was thinking, yeah, they are a, it's a good brand, but they do nothing for the environment. But that wasn't true. And then I sent him a pic in 2019 from the sales meeting from the Gletscher Initiative. Yeah. And um, this was the point where I connected um, Nicola and Adrian. And so they started to work together and um, make some projects. What convinced you? <laughs> well, I think our ambassadors are our most valuable asset that we have as an organization. And if somebody like Nicolas tells me my brand is really stepping up to the plate and making and implementing changes, then I believe him. So that was the moment I thought. So you took a closer look to it. And yes. it was worth it, obviously, because you have some project that, that you're sharing now. Exactly, yes. It was very impressive when we started talking together. It was quite, it became clear, clear quite quickly that actually Mammut has been doing a lot in the last few years, but that they've really not been communicating a lot around it. So. When we sat at a table for the first time, I was impressed. The whole, our whole team was impressed. And so we started you know, talking together, where can we make something happen? Where can we implement mm -hmm. the project together? And right now, we've been working on a pilot project together, which has been very, very inspiring. It's about recycling ropes, because ropes, as some, most of you know, are the DNA of mammut. Mm -hmm. But they also have one of the biggest footprints of mammut, because they're made out of polyamide. And polyamide is basically oil. Yeah. So we're talking about a lot of oil being made into ropes. And now we're, we're in a program together with Mammut where we're recycling those ropes and putting them into a circular economy and making T-shirts out of them. So it's like a pilot project, but from mm -hmm. what I hear, I think there's a lot of uh, energy to make it larger and implement it full scale. And there's more projects ahead that you, you're planning on, I know that, but let's maybe first now we're gonna get back to that point see what POW stands for, protect our winters. What is the mission? I mean, the, obviously the winters need to get protected. That's a whole impact on the entire climate on the world. But how is POW dedicated to that? Well, I'd say first and foremost, we're a community. We try to gather all outdoor people to engage against climate change. We mobilize these people we have. And when I mean community, we're talking about athletes like Nicola, mm -hmm. talking about brands like Mahmoud, scientists like Matthias, yeah. but also creatives, photographers. Um, so we gather these people around a common subject of climate change and mobilize them to act. I think what's uniting us all is our passion. I think the passion for the mountains. So we're trying to use this passion and turn it into purpose and, you know, make something out of this passion. Because if we don't protect our playgrounds now, it's going to be too late in 50 years. So I think this is really where we have an angle. In Switzerland, we... There is an estimate, so there's a study that about almost 50% of the Swiss population considers themselves as going to the mountains regularly. So 
we're talking about a big, big mm -hmm. community that we're trying to reach. And we can only do it together with others. Uh, as Nicola was also saying, alone we're also just a little small factor. So it needs the entire society. Thank you, Nicholas. Maybe I take the chance to now have a closer look to this footprint in generally not, but the symptom. One of the symptoms that there is is where is this very visual? The glaciers. Um, that's where your focus is, Matthias. And is it possible to give us an overview of what's happening? You just had new numbers, um, uh, new measurements of the data published this week. What is the latest results? So first of all, it's very clear that uh, glaciers are strongly receding in Switzerland, but also worldwide. And what we have to realize is that glaciers are actually a symbol of a healthy mountain environment. So if we like, if we love mountains, mm -hmm. we are also attached to glaciers. And their loss symbolizes that something is changing and something bad is going on. Yeah. And these changes are really fast. So last year we lost, again, 2% of the whole volume of glaciers in the Alps, once again. And this happened every year in the last uh, five to 10 years. So it's really a rapid pace that is going on and it's even accelerating compared to, uh, to some decades ago. So maybe to give us an overview, we have right now, you told me a situation of about the whole Swiss glaciers put together would be 50 ice cubes by the length and height and wideness of one kilometer, 50 of those. Can you make with these, with these ice cubes visualizations, can you give us a picture of the last 20 years? How was it 20 years ago? How it was that number so of ice cubes? Right now we have about these 50 ice cubes yeah. that are left. Uh -huh. But about these 50 ice cubes have already been left in the last uh, 60 to 70 years. Okay. So this would fill up the whole Lake of Constance. So what we, in, with what we have lost just in Switzerland, in terms of glacier ice. So it's really a huge amount of loss that we yeah. have, and these changes are even accelerating. And this is really a, a big problem. We also have pictures seen in the documentary, and I think we can show them again, of the Alech Glacier. Maybe um, I ask the editors to show us these pictures, because there you can clearly see as well that melting of this, here we have it, um, how it looked in 2019, and how it looked back in 2006. And also the stray comparison, if we look forward now, what's your prediction? I mean, that's hard for you to do, but I mean, where are is, we going? This is what our models say, if uh, climate is evolving according to different scenarios. And on the left, we see uh, an extreme scenario with business as usual, so no climate mitigation. And then the if right- If we keep on living like we do now, exactly. within the 20 last year, 20 years, yes. if that continues on, nobody does nothing. If Mahmoud and Pa wouldn't exist, we would say we don't care. And that's on the left side. And what on the right, we see what we worse. can achieve in the very best case in terms of Alec Glacier. And uh, it's quite important to realize, so for this yeah. glacier, basically it will recede anyway very strongly. So we cannot save it, but still we can make a big difference. And uh, I but think it's, it's worthwhile to do it because we yeah. want to preserve and some of our And it's very late already. If, if I look at that, why can't we do more if we would really, really change now? The problem is that glaciers have a long lag. They have a memory of the past climate. And the big glaciers, as Alec Glacier that we saw here, uh, still remembers what happened 50 years ago. So if we stop climate change now, the glaciers will still recede. So we cannot save this one, but importantly, we can save the big ice masses on the poles, the Antarctic and Greenland. Yeah. And this is important at a global level in terms of sea level rise. So there we can really make a difference. For the Swiss glacier, we can make a small difference between nothing and a bit. But for mountaineers, it's already much better if we still can preserve a bit. Yeah, we, we will just open up to a global view, but I want to first talk about that Pizzol glacier, which is pretty much your home base of research, or it has been actually. Yes, it's a, it's a very small glacier in eastern Switzerland. And I, I was personally attached to that one because it was a glacier I started measuring and I really followed up the death of this glacier. And it's, happened, it, it's happening so fast, you can't even imagine. So in the first place when I started measuring, uh, it just became smaller and smaller every year. But then after 2017, 
started disintegrating within three years, basically. It, it really disappeared. And uh, about three weeks, it was last time when I was up there, um, we decided to really stop the measurements because it's not a site you can actually uh, recover some good measurements. It's too small, it's too dangerous. There are many rocks falling down. Um, and it was so touching for myself to see this uh, disappearance of this glacier. So the glacier is dead, actually. It's dead, and it's not a single case. So it's many, many places in the Alps, and also worldwide, I guess, that you see um, these pro processes of disappearing glaciers, and many have already disappeared, uh, and this will continue and even accelerate in the next decades. So a lot has to happen. That's also why we're sitting here, thank you, Mahmoud, and discussing this subject. Maybe let's open it up to a global um, problem, which it obviously is. We feel it strongly when we have glaciers, but also it will have an impact on the oceans, of course, and more and more. I can't name it all, but we asked our colleagues from all over the globe, our mammoth colleagues from Scandinavia, Japan, and Northern America, to give us a short statement of how it looks like with the climate change this season or this year in their countries and that for first of all i would like to go to rintaro to japan how is it looking like there here in tokyo japan the global warming is very big issue in this year in august we had 19 days over 35 degrees very hot days even today 13th october it's a uh, over 25 degrees we don't need jacket. There is one glacier in Tatiyama Lenho. It's also melting year by year. We're really concerned about it. So that was a view from Japan. Let's look the to the situation in Scandinavia where we've asked Carl. Here in Scandinavia, scientists estimate that most of our glaciers are gone within the next 80 years. Nygårdsbreen, one of the glacier arms of Justedalsbreen, mainland Europe's biggest glacier, has receded nearly 500 meters within the last 20 years. In the 2018 season, none of the recorded glaciers in Scandinavia actually grew. In fact, the average loss was 33 meters, a record number. In the polar north on the island of Svalbard, the effects of climate change is even more severe. Here lies, lies glaciers that dwarfs their European cousins, but even these giants are soon lost. Three times the temperature rise of Oslo and six times the global average. Plus degree weather and rain in January is now reality, even in the long polar night. Within 80 years, a lifetime, even the biggest glacier in Europe is gone. Thank you very much, Carl. And now the last view will go over to the North America, and there we have Medi giving us an overview of the U.S. climate situation. Here in the U.S., 2020 has been a year full of floods, hurricanes, and deadly wildfires that have swept across our nation. Currently in Colorado, it's advised not to go outside because of the smoke caused by a wildfire. We've seen the effects of climate change on our glaciers, in our weather patterns, and in the places we love to play. While 2020 has been a year full of chaos, extremes, political battles over climate change, it has also been a year of recognition. Right now, right this moment, we are presented with an opportunity to join together to fight for climate change, to take steps as an organization to lead the conversation and create initiatives that inspire change, create purpose, and encourage movements that better our planet, to support organizations like Protect Our Winners, we're working towards creating nonpartisan policies, awareness, and solutions that move our earth, our country, our states to a better future. It's not about one person or one solution. It's about all of us joining together, taking small steps and supporting big steps so generations to come can experience the glaciers and experience a world moved by mountains. So it's getting even more obvious by seeing all this, hearing you and have a, a quick look around the globe. Something needs to happen. And that's what we've already seen very clearly also in the documentary. And this is something Mammoth is really now dedicated to. But that's not, not that new, right? It's been a long time, actually. 
it's been a long time. I think it's really interesting what uh, you mentioned that uh, a lot of people I talk to, they do not in the first place think of Mammut as a sustainable brand. But when I talk to uh, Adrian or when we look around here, we see that these processes of uh, addressing corporate responsibility have started very early. So uh, to like, give an example, yeah, 2008, uh -huh. we were the first outdoor brand to join the Fairway Foundation to really monitor social standards in our global supply chain. And these were accompanied by many, uh, a lot of new uh, initiatives, projects, partnerships that went on. Um, yeah, we see it here on the screen as well. It was a long journey. So this is all what Mammut has been doing so far, right? Yeah, it's kind of a summary where you see certain yeah. steps um, that we built up. Mm -hmm. And especially when you look at the latest years, 2018, 2019, you see that clear direction also towards um, addressing the topic of climate protection. So we signed the UN Fashion Industry Charter on climate action which is a commitment that until 2050, we will go net zero. We want to reduce our carbon footprint by 30% now until 2030. Is that realistic? <laughs> it can be. Sure, I mean, that's, that's what we are working on. I mean, uh, without going too much into detail because I, I don't want to interrupt you, but what I loved is what you said and you as well, if you're not part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. And that's actually what we noticed already long time ago I mean, we're one of the player in the, uh, and I think an important player in that industry. So we have to make the change happen, and we have to start within Mammut. You know, I mean, uh, maybe we haven't been that good in communicating it, but we started already early on to 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 work on it, and we have put a program in place um, which helps us to achieve the goals which we signed and yeah. feel. Really You're really aiming to really achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe the communication, that's something interesting I want to talk about too. Alicia, you had a, let's call it glacier moment, where this, all what we've seen on the charter before, the single things you were doing with Mammut since a long time, you, you kind of brought it all together. Well, it was, actually we were discussing a lot on how we can communicate what we do. It's a lot of puzzle pieces, a lot of technical information. So how can you emotionalize kind of this topic and bring all these initiatives together? And um, that was you and your team and your corporate responsibility team. Yeah, I mean, we it's were outstanding looking... that you have an entire team at Mammoth working yes, we have. for corporate responsibility. It's not only our team. I mean, in the product teams in each department I work with, there's a lot of intrinsic motivation to address that topic. As okay, they're that's all mountain that's lovers. Nice to hear. Yeah. And we have our athletes also very much involved in that. Yeah, so this idea came up that Actually, we, we sometimes think we are a small player and we're also not perfect, right? We're producing products, we sell products. So how can we step up and say, hey, we want to do something for the climate? Maybe this is uh, really a, it's a bit difficult of conflict. message. Yeah. So we said, in a way, it still needs us. And we are doing since many years, we can prove that our path and our journey to really become more responsible in the way we produce products, in the way we do our services, and we want to go on that learning journey, but also do that together with our employees, with our athletes, with certain partners, based on what we know from science and how mm -hmm. we can achieve that through innovation as well. And um, I did a mountain tour some month ago where I had this idea that actually our movement should be called Together for Glaciers, because the glaciers are kind of our heritage, our core, the landscapes that fascinate us. And we are one part in protecting them and in standing up for them. And we cannot do this alone as yeah. a brand or as individuals. As we heard, we need to do that together. And then you had, I think, it all written down <laughs> on a glacier and you came yeah, it was, back to Sion. It yeah, was this little it, message. Um, I took a picture and I, uh, I sent it to Oliver Pops. I said, hey, this is... Kind of the message. Can you show it quickly to the camera so we can catch that? Because it's, no, the other side, what you wrote. So yeah, I think that's quite impressive since um, <laughs> you, you, I picture you on this glacier where it's not always too warm in ideal times and then you write it down very clearly. And then she came into your office and you thought, oh, I mean, having the idea is one thing, but then supporting is it the way you do it. Now, Oliver also as a CEO, that's the other thing, right? Yeah, actually, I got a picture. She, you, you have sent it to me in a, in a, in a WhatsApp chat. 
And uh, since we have been working on it together, and I'm uh -huh. actually emotionally a lot, uh, really big time attached to it, I was happy that, uh, in a way, uh, Alicia found it in the mountains, yeah, which is more or less uh, representing even more the idea. And I mean, what, what you said is, um, before, what, what our job is, I mean, all of us have, has, has got a personal journey. I mean, I'm on my personal journey as well. I learned a lot since I'm here with Mahmoud. Uh, and that's, that's good, but on the other hand, I have the chance to, to, to motivate more than 800 people. We have a lot of people out there uh, who are working with us, and, and that's why I believe we can create that Together for Glacier moment. On us, it's for sure, to, in a way, to decouple that what our job is, mm -hmm. meaning certain growth, developing products, working with uh, athletes uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, to reduce our own footprint. It's kind and of this, that conflict, what I said Now, before. I wouldn't call it conflict. I, I think it is, as I said before, if you're part of the problem, you feel part of the problem, mm -hmm. then you're part of the solution, and we have to decouple it. I mean, it sounds a bit technical, but we can do that. I'm convinced we can do that. And it's, now it's on us to do it step by step. I mean, you will not do it from one day to the other. That's why we have actually a couple of years uh, down the road to go, but it's possible. Uh, and I, honestly, I like it even as a personal challenge because, I mean, we have to take care of the playground, as you said. And uh, it's as well for the, for the generations to come, we have a responsibility. I have a responsibility in my role, and I'm uh, ready to take it. And that's exactly what PAU stands for. So that's a nice way where, where, where these philosophies cross. Yeah, it's interesting because you said we all sort of we all have a footprint and what does that, you know, what does it mean for us? Um, often we, I think one of the big problems of the climate movement or about, about us loving the mountains, but also using the mountains or traveling to the mountains is that we feel guilty and a guilt some often holds us back. We're like we think we're not allowed to say something. We, we think we're not allowed to act for the environment. But I yeah. think and what POW really stands for is this, also this concept of imperfect advocacy. So we're all not perfect people. None of us is. None of the companies out there are. None of us individuals are. We all have a footprint, but still, we all also have a voice. And I think it's really important that we realize that we can use that voice and that we can make and demand for changes. Yeah. Us, the mountain community. Yeah, we're out. part of both systems. Exactly. The economical one and also the environmental one. Maybe back also quickly to you, Oliver. Um, as a CEO, the personal impact, this dedication had on you, is there, or, or anybody, but uh, just because you're the CEO, I'm trying to start with this question with you, is like, what have you changed since you're... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the question is awesome. quite interesting. We had that conversation uh, the other day, and I'm from the generation, <laughs> that's what she would love to hear. Is I'm from the generation <laughs> where you uh, still love to, dry, to ride a Porsche, you know? Uh, and, and for sure, it is uh, coming from a different generation. You, has, you as well have to adapt yeah. Uh, your own uh, uh, consumption behavior. And, and, and I mean, I started to do it. I'm happy that you said nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect at all. But I see that I, I take my own steps, you know. Uh, you you come actually, to work with a bike? Uh, in the meantime, as well as a bicycle, not that often. I wouldn't say every day. I have a daughter as well, you know, who's pushing me. So in a way, I think it's on a personal level and uh, uh, as well on, on, on a level where I can have an impact. So I, yeah. I, I as well raise my voice, uh -huh. I make use of it, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And that's something probably especially the youth is doing nowadays, I mean, since Greater Thunberg anyway, and that's the point where I want to ask Markus Rech as a representative of also the customers that end up also in mammoth stores. And are they really... Do they really want that when they're in the store? Are they also ready to pay more for a good product as long as it's sustainable? Or is that only just interesting as long as the price is still low? Because that's clearly what comes with it, with the whole greed, the rise of the price. I guess it's not really the discussion about the price. And I can only encourage everyone to, to make these steps as you discuss it, uh, or as we discuss it here in this panel. Group. Just because what we've seen is a dramatic shift towards sales developments, towards brands that put an effort on sustainable initiatives within their company. And it's not only about the, uh, about the single product, but rather the whole brand uh, what uh, representing such initiatives. And um, that's 
for retailers and for brands at the same time. Yeah? It's not for retailers who make a buying decision for brands in their store um, that they are not responsible for that development. But clearly, uh, to come back to that question, it's not really the discussion about the price. Products should be potentially equally priced, but consumers, the more they get educated in that topic, coming to stores or coming to a web shop, they demand answers for their questions. Um, and clearly, sustainable answers is something that they ask for. So let's let's turn it around maybe to the other extreme. How much and ask how much is it a must nowadays also in the retail industry for brands to be on that green path, to use that uh, as a marketing tool as well? Can you still survive without that at all nowadays? Well, as, uh, as long as functionality, especially in the safety environment, what we've seen earlier, uh, have, have seen in, in, in the documentary, is very important because it saves your life. And definitely that comes beforehand, before the discussion of a sustainable product. But it's not a contradiction. I mean, we see many products already that, that offer the solution being safe and uh, sustainably produced. Um, but in the long run, I mean, it's a chance for everyone to make money with it and save our nature and our environment at the same time. So I don't um, see a contradiction, but I, I would see a contradiction if you're not on that path for uh, more sustainable products, just because um, people and, and younger generations ask for it and it saves our planet. So there is no alternative. And going into the numbers in my head, I mean, we've clearly seen a dramatic uh, sales shift from brands which are not pursuing such strategies in contrast to brands that bring that forward quite heavily. Which makes totally sense nowadays anyway, because it's, and that's also the way it should be, I think, because if somebody contributes, then that's good for them to survive and not the other ones. Maybe also let's talk about the importance of the retail um, brands or industry generally of their impact to society, because uh, Matthias, for example, you, you do the research, you have the numbers, you put them out also in the political field, but also we've seen clearly also, I don't want to come in too much into the political discussion, but there is borders for politics as well to move a society, right? So I think the importance of us all as a society is quite big um, to have an impact on this problem. How do you as a scientist see an engagement like mammoths in that field. Are you thankful for that or do you think it's not helping or where do you stand as a scientist towards this? It's a difficult question for me as a scientist because it's not some my field but I, I answer as a, as a person and yeah. I think it's very important that a, a big brand goes ahead and tells the users and the people that's a way we should take and therefore maybe convince them to think of themselves and to try to contribute themselves as well. So uh, I think if the big brands start going ahead, it also puts pressure on the other brands. And I mean, it's a problem, global climate change is a problem we can only solve as a society, so mm -hmm. together. So, and, and the more uh, people engage in it, the higher the chances, chances are that we are finally going to get there and can make a change. Yeah. Maybe let's open up this, thank you very much, this, this um, perspective of every single one. Maybe also you, Oliver, what do you think is, is, is the whole also communication, if you see all these little things and then you put mammoth in the whole, where do you see mammoth in the entire mm. I mean, field? maybe just to comment on, on what, what you guys said when Marcus was, was uh, sharing his insights, I was immediately thinking about um, building on your questions. Mm -hmm. Let's not look in, in, in limitations, understand what, what kind of possibilities we mm -hmm. have. And I mean, for sure you ask what kinds of limitations politicians have, and I don't want to comment on that. Uh, being a German, I even guessed in, in Switzerland, but still, I mean, we have much more possibilities if we think in possibilities and not in limitations. I was, I was coming to that point because even in a safety product, like Marco said, you can uh, work it out in a more, I would say, uh, uh, in, with, with a footprint which has uh, less CO2 versus more CO2. I mean, we can, uh, for example, our Barrybox, our safety product is produced in Switzerland. Mm 
It's mm -hmm. a Swiss product. Obviously, different footprints, and if we would produce it somewhere at the, uh, in another angle in the world. So you, we can take daily decisions. That's what I would like to say. Daily, we can take a decision in a way to make it as well every day a bit better. And I would like to invite everybody, and that's our how Alice described it, our movement, which we would like to create, all of us doing it every day a little bit better, and uniting that, it, it will help all of us. And that's more or less my understanding and where I would like to change as well on, on a personal level, mm -hmm. why I'm changing on a personal level. For you, Nicola, when you hear this discussion going on, what kind of a feeling does that give to you to go on a glacier and knowing about the split that needs to be done, but also is that giving you hope for kind of trying to, to I mean, you have a long life ahead with your age, so do you think you can still have the j same job till high ages? Um, to be honest, I'm a sportsman and my career is limited to my age, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course, when you look at Stef Sigrist, he's um, 20 years older than me and um, he's um, also, also in the business. So I have maybe 20 other years where I can go into the mountains, but I think in these 20 years a lot will, a lot, uh, will change. So when we see the, the glaciers melting actually with the models, so um, yeah, it's, it's scary, but um, I think there is also hope that we together that we can um, try to to fix this problem and st mm. so um, yeah. Looks hard though to see the Switzerland without <laughs> glaciers. That is for us Swiss. I mean, I've seen you a little bit in the documentary. How's that for you? That was, or what's the plan? I mean, maybe I sh should more talk about what's the vision. Um, for me, it was very powerful to feel at Mammut to have a base of people that is intrinsically motivated, mm -hmm. that works on that topic since many years, to have also the buy-in from a top management to be on that journey. Yeah. And for me, the vision would be to really create a world where we are aware of the topic and where we see the opportunities and the possibilities to become better step by step. And with that, I mean, we will see changes and we will have to deal with them. And I hope that they remind us to keep on track every day. Is that enough? What do you think? <laughs> I think it's one part of the solution for sure. I mean, that's, that's about putting us each other together and, and helping each other. I think what's one part that you sort of mentioned uh, is um, that we really need to come together as a society and make those changes. And for us, it also means getting all those different actors on board. I mean, the reason why we're here with Mammut is not only that they make their products better, but what we actually want to achieve is that, we're giving a concrete example, next year when we have the vote, probably, most likely, on the CO2 bill, that we have these big companies stepping up and saying, we need this law because it implements the Paris Agreement, which we have signed as Switzerland, as a, as a nation, and that these companies will join us in our advocacy efforts at POW and get, all that, get that message across to all those outdoor lovers. I think that's where we really want to go. We want to mobilize these different actors to really stand up. And I think that's, the, for us, the ultimate ambition. And I think by listening to all of these different parties and still there, it's all coming from one direction, maybe as a picture, what I take with me home is it looks to me a little bit like a dance that, you know, always a new partner is coming in, but it's very rhythmic, it's very... So it's, it's, a, it's a good one. And, and that's, I think, for me, that's probably the most outstanding in this whole expertise round as a, let's say, simple customer. That gives hope. And also as a human being, which we all are, and as a Swiss girl protecting our globe, actually. And um, I think, I hope, we have a lot of questions also from our viewers out there. I would first thank you very much for all the inputs that came. Don't run off yet because let's see if we find some questions from our viewer from all over the globe that came in okay here we can see them what are some quick wins that each of us can implement right now to fight climate change what are examples for people in the room okay maybe i think the way i interpret it is what do we personally do can we have the question shown again? What do we person? What is our personal impact 
to reduce climate change. I think. I mean, I mean, yeah? I, I, I can answer that question, maybe not on that personal level, uh, uh, more when it comes to what we do, because it can get very concrete, or it is very concrete. Um, like you said, all of us have to contribute. One is, for example, that we as well advocate for that CO2 bill. That mm -hmm. is one element, and that's why we are here. Second is, at Mammut, we have, uh, let's say, we, we created three buckets. One is more or less how to reduce our own footprint within our four walls. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Wherever we are, we look at how do we reduce it. With little steps, you can improve can you your give us an example? Uh, for example, what kind of energy you use to, uh, uh, to heat up, the, to heat up the, the house or whatever. Um, second is, uh, second element, or let's say even more interesting is the third element. I come back to the second in a moment. You said uh, what kind of material we do purchase uh -huh. to make product, products out of it. That's a big thing because it's in, uh, let's say, it, it involves uh, upstream into the, uh, into the production and downstream towards our retailers. There are a lot of elements uh, we can do. Um, and um, uh, the second element is how do we travel, for example? Like uh, you said, like you said once how much a year do we fly? How do, fly. We, how do we commute? Are we still commute as much as possible? So it's a four wall. Mm -hmm. It's outside, so to say, out of all four walls. And then how do we have an impact on our value chain upstream to the producer? Where do we produce? What do we produce? And how do we interact with the retailer? Yeah. Um, that's more or less, I mean, even how do we, what kind of packaging we do have? You know? Yeah, this is now talked for the brand. But for me personally, I ask myself sometimes as well, if I clean my teeth, do I turn the water off? Is that, because I do that, and if I don't, I feel bad. But is that really helping? I mean, when I read that question, if I may, Chris, yeah, three, sure. three points for us, it's always this most three, the three most important points. Eat less meat travel more sustainably, go and vote. That's what you can do. And it's, it's really as simple as that. Especially in Switzerland, where we Especially all have Especially in Switzerland, voice. I yeah. mean, but all over the world where you can yeah. vote, where you have yeah. the right to yeah. vote. Exercise your duty, your privilege as a citizen. I think that's super important. And so then- Participate in society, basically, right? Yeah. And in the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And um, think about what, yeah, what you eat, what you purchase. Yeah. Now, I hope we have more questions. We have a little technical problem here with the screens, but I'm sure we can get that right from our backside doors. What about bioplastic for Mahmoud look at, looking at alternatives materials? Maybe I can say something about that. You can that. jump yeah. on it, yeah. Sure. Um, we're working on a project like um, how can we reduce single-use plastic? And we do that on EOG level, so it's a whole European-based project. Um, and what we find, because we did a life cycle assessment of our poly bags, of plastic bags, is that biodegradable plastics, for example, at the moment are not really a solution because they have a higher footprint in the production, mm -hmm. mostly. And secondly, we have the problem that there are not really, there is not a system in place where we can really compost the plastics, so in, at the end consumer, we still would throw them away and burn yeah. them. So there's not really a solution for that at the moment. But we are trying to, or we try to address the topic by using the plastic that still has the best uh, footprint when it comes to production, okay. but then bring it into a circular system where we recycle it. So we don't produce more and more plastic and we uh, in the end, <laughs> have the plastic in the oceans and in landfills, yeah. but we bring the plastic back into a closed system and reuse it. So that's, at the moment, the solution we're working on. All right, thank you so much. I think that was a great example. Is there more questions that we may answer? Uh, there we go, the screens work again. Are you also looking for recycling old mammoth material? For example, if I have an old jacket, I can, oh, can I turn it in? So it gets recycled for something new. Everyone's looking at me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are thinking of models, like uh, we are in the moment evaluating different systems, how we could actually take back clothes and recycle them. <laughs> we still have to find out. So we're um, in a phase there where we have to figure out how this could work for Mammut. 
At the moment, what we do is we repair. Yeah. Uh, we have a repair service, and I think this is also a real contribution to um, our footprint, but especially for our consumers' footprint. If you don't just buy a new jacket every time, but you bring it back and you repair so it. So if I have a broken zipper, I can come back in any store exactly. or wherever I bought it, and then I'll have it You will have repair it repaired free, from our basically. repaired service. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And uh, I hope that this is a system that we will be able to take back clothes and make new out of them that we can implement in future. But we're working on that. All right. Thank you. And I think for the time we have one left question and then it's about time to close up this nice discussion. How can I make sure that a brand is not greenwashing? Asks Adrian Schurter. I think that's a, a good point, which we've also discussed uh, a lot, Oliver and I, in advance for me to prepare for this um, panel discussion. Because, and also we had it, Nicola. Greenwashing is a big subject. Maybe also, Matthias, if you feel like participating, go ahead. Who has the answer? How do I know yeah, it's I, not greenwashed? It's, it's a big question. I mean, the, uh, I, I think we are so transparent now. You know, our world gets so transparent. That's a big, uh, um, I, I think the big gift of digitization is that everything is transparent, openly communicated. Actually, we publish on our website as well what we do. I don't think you can fool a consumer. It's impossible. Not anymore. Also, it's no. social media. I, 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 I truly believe it's impossible. And I think, uh, at least from the Mammut standpoint, we don't want to do that. <laughs> so it's literally. <laughs> I mean, we, we take that challenge and, and we, we uh, will make it happen. Maybe also not from a, from a consumer perspective. How do I know? I mean, we also, every time we get approached by a company, the first thing we do is like a little due diligence to see what the company is really doing. Is it for real? Is it just some nice little statistics? While we're not engineers or consultants that have the possibility to really look into detail, I think it's on a high level you see really quickly which company really means it when which company is just trying to market a green profile. Because as you say, most of the information is accessible nowadays. Almost all the companies have sustainability reports. You can read up and you quickly find out which, which one is just for real and which is not. Um, I think there has been a lot of also maybe bad examples in the past. You mean greenwashing? I think there has been, but I think a lot of people are, are realizing that's not, that's just not the future anymore. And um, especially in the outdoor industry. Mm -hmm. The outdoor They're industry is so marked by, by this business of pre yeah. and, and protecting the environment. So it's also a bit of an honor thing, probably. If you sell something, you want to stand behind the product. Yeah. It's kind of I mean, look, look to the US, for instance, how brands have come together to really fight also against the incumbent president because they want a president that protects the outdoors. And I think this is what's, what we're seeing happening, that brands are really making this step. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very positive about this. Okay. Um, maybe to close up, I would like a little stand, statement of everyone. I start with you, Matthias, looking into the future with knowing so exactly as you do what it looks like for glaciers and globally the impact it has. What's your hope, a realistic hope? So my, my hope is that we as a community, as a global community, we get together to protect climate and therefore to save at least some of the beautiful planet we have now, uh, preserve as much as we can. We cannot keep everything the same it is now, but we can make a big change when coming together. And this is my big hope. That's nice. You say we still can make a big change. <laughs> It's not too late yet, but it's 5 to 12. Thank you very much, Matthias. Oliver? Yeah, uh, let, me, let me commit to that hope and, and that we're going to do a good job to, to contribute to it. Do we still have Marcus here? What is your yeah. hope listening to us in Switzerland here? What do you think? <laughs> well, embrace it as a chance and see the advantages not only for society, but also for your business. And I definitely believe in the long run, this will be uh, also for a sustainable development um, of a company, very important to embrace it. Yeah. Thank you. Nicola. My hope is that we embrace this momentum that we have right now going on as a society and that we really make the necessary changes 
to get our um, forward we and don't protect just the climate. talk about it yeah, we really exactly. have to make them yes. to change yes. i go from one nicola to climbing nicola what is your hope um i hope that we take this last chance to to really improve our uh, footprints and that each part of our society work together and i think together we can we can uh, achieve something and we can save our planet and we have only one planet so <laughs> that's what it is about right yeah. it's about time alice yeah i mean nicolas just uh, took a bit of what i wanted to say it's it's that momentum i feel that during the last month i was very encouraged and strengthened in feeling not very small in front of a big problem but feeling part of the solution and i really hope that we can get this message across and invite people to become part of the solution as well I want to thank you all very, very much, and I really wish you all the best success for this movement. I'm definitely going to be part of it in some ways and however we can and try to carry it out. And I think that's our responsibility, which each and every single one of us have. Thank you so much for being our guest in the name of Mammut and for sharing your opinions and points of view. Now, also thank you, I want to also thank you from all over the globe that have been watching for your comments and your impacts to the discussion. And thank you for your interest. Maybe last point, don't forget, we've mentioned it before already, on this com upcoming Thursday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. European time, we have another discussion where it's all about glaciers again. All right, thank you very much. And now I'll let you go. Have a good evening and goodbye. Meet the majestic Swiss mountains, home to the world's most technical and historically rich climbing and outdoor culture. In this place, Casper Tanner started a local rope factory in 1862. In the 160 years that followed, the Mammut brand became synonymous with world-leading mountaineering and outdoor products allowing people all over the world to enjoy the mountains safely, enabling the fullest range of experiences in the most demanding conditions that deeply change you. On each adventure, we allow the world's leading professionals, extreme athletes, and everyday explorers to enjoy the mountain safely. We consistently bring the most innovative products made to spend unforgettable moments out in the open, made to conquer what was deemed inaccessible, made to protect our beautiful but melting glaciers. We take meaningful actions to preserve these natural wonders for the generations to come. Whether it be the exhilaration, the pleasure of a picturesque hike, or the appreciation of riding down a steep face, these experiences deepen connections to ourselves, others, and the natural world. Join us to create a world moved by mountains.